I've done this before, I've done this talk before, and uh, I'm comparing two technologies, Varnish versus Nginx, and I used a stereotype. I used a sort of Viking hat and a sort of Russian cap, meaning that Varnish was invented by Norwegians or a Danish guy working for a Norwegian company, and Nginx was developed by Russian people. I don't know, stereotypes are tricky. I have people saying to me, oh, Vikings didn't really wear those hats, or this is not a Viking hat. Anyway, during the course of this talk, when I refer to Varnish, you will see this on screen. When I refer, refer to Nginx, you will see this on screen. So, we're good on that? Okay, let's do this. Hello, everyone. My name is Thais. That's how you pronounce this thing, Thais. I am a Belgian person, Dutch-speaking Belgian person. I am on Twitter. Any of you on Twitter? If you heard of this, yes, I am on there. And if you want to, you can heckle me, ask me questions, or just have lovely interactions with me. Professionally, I'm a technical evangelist. It's not the same shirt, I bought a different one. I'm a technical evangelist at a web hosting company, a Belgian web hosting company called Combell. Yes, we do hosting. No, I'm not going to tell you that much about it. The talk which should explain stuff we do. In my spare time, if any, I'm involved with a small community called PHP Benelux. Who has ever heard of that? Please raise your hand. That is quite good. Who has attended our conference? Very nice. Still room for potential, though. So, the hats, I have to tell something. There, there's, there's an addition to these hats. <laughs> Being that we're in the UK right now, right? We have a different hat for that. And uh, I would like to use the opportunity to thank you for being in the UK again. This is my 12th talk in the UK, and I always like being here. I love the interaction with the crowd, and I really, really, really hope we can interact in an interesting way. If you feel the need to interrupt me, please do so. I don't mind, and let's get the show going. What's a reverse proxy? It's a direct question. It's not anything else. What is a reverse proxy? I would like to hear some definitions. Maybe we could do it like comedy shows where the people in the front rows get screwed over, so... Uh, <laughs> who knows? What are reverse proxies, people? Anyone? Yeah, something like that. I'm going to ask for three definitions. Now, I have an hour, so even if we don't get through this slide, <laughs> I have an hour. So we have one. Anyone else? I need something here, right here. What is a reverse proxy according to you? No one? Have you, who has never, let, let's do this fair and square, who has never heard or does not know what a reverse proxy is? Raise your hand, please. Yes, okay, fair enough. You didn't raise your hand, did you? <laughs> Don't be shy. There's only a couple of thousands of people who watch this video afterwards. So no big one. A reverse proxy, I will give you the answer. A reverse proxy, why would we use such a thing? It is a machine we put in front of another machine to either hide the origin server or to do SSL termination, to do load balancing, caching, and or compression. And today, we'll primarily focus on the caching bit. Why do we need caching? And I can tell you a, a long story about how the internet evolved, but let's skip that. Nowadays, the loads or the, the delays don't really happen at the client end as they used to when we had slow connections. We have broadband now. Do we have that in the UK as well, broadband? Yeah? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But now, because a lot of people have broadband and internet has matured, everyone uses it, the load's at the server end. And the goal here, using a reverse caching proxy, is to make sure our little project here is nicely protected. That's the goal. And when you're still in doubt, dear people in the front row and anywhere in this room, I always use this. The story of Kevin and Winnie. Who's seen this 90s blockbuster movie called The Bodyguard? Who has seen this movie? Okay, yeah, cool. So it is a story about Kevin Costner being, I think his name is Frank Farmer in the movie, protecting the big star Whitney Houston by just standing in front of her. And that uh, keeps away stalky fans. And that's ex exactly what Varnish and Nginx do. They keep away stalky traffic and make sure that Whitney, being our web server and our PHP application, behaves as it should be behaving. So uh, even if you're still in doubt, even if you don't get it, you, just yet, this is a sort of schematic overview. The client, being the browser, wants to send traffic to the web server, right? But we want to make sure there's a mechanism in front of it that protects them, without actually interfering with the actual traffic, because the client still thinks he's talking to a web server, which is not the case, it's a proxy. And on the other end, the web server still thinks it's talking to a browser, whereas it's talking 
through a sort of intermediary system. And that's what we'll be focusing on. And HTTP is the protocol we'll be using, and I guess most of you being developers understand what HTTP is and what HTTP does. And I'd like to tell you a story about browser cache. Who's been on the internet since like the late 90s, the mid 90s? And browser cache was a thing, because everyone tried to flush it, because we always wanted the most recent updates. And why is this browser caching old things for me? I didn't understand, I didn't fully appreciate it. Now that I work at a web hosting company where we do all these sorts of things, uh, I started to appreciate cache control headers. Who uses cache control headers in his or her project? Nice. So you have mature enough projects that you control the state of the cache yourself, which is the, probably the way to go. And you have different syntaxes. We have maxh, smaxh, we have expires, we have all sorts of things. But the problem with traditional browser cache is that you can flush the cache yourself. There's multiple versions of the cache. So putting the cache on the end of the user can be somewhat tricky. So that's why we move it to the proxy level. So the proxy, as you've seen in the schematic overview, tries to communicate between both ends, but if it knows the response from the web server, it will store it locally and make sure that all the next requests coming in don't really hit your back end, they just hit the proxy, and the proxy gives a cached version. How long does it cache it? Based on your cache control headers. Now, there's some things that aren't really cacheable, and uh, let's ask that as a sort of tricky question as well. Why are posts put and deletes not cacheable? Anyone? Yeah, it's every time it's gonna be different. There's this really fancy word, item potency, right? for people who do RESTful stuff. Uh, well, if there's a post, a put or delete, it should be the case that the reverse caching proxy does not cache it. If there's cookies, if there's cookies involved, either cookies being sent from the client end or set cookie instructions from the server end, usually you don't want to cache. Why? Because a cookie or a set cookie implies user-specific data, so that means the page as such is not really unique for you, or unique and global in general, but unique for you. So you might not want to cache that, might. There will be exceptions, you'll see that. If there's authorization involved, so that means if you have to log in, it's probably something that is not public, and as such not cacheable. Or if the time to live, so the cache control header or other mechanisms say that it shouldn't be cached. So let's meet our lovely stereotypical contenders today. On the one hand, in the left corner, we have Varnish, in the right corner we have our dear friends at Nginx, and let's start with Varnish. Varnish Cache is a project, an open source project, we'll, we'll be talking about free and open source software here, invented by a Danish person called Poul Henningkamp, and he made that project as a, a, a tailored project for a Norwegian newspaper called Verdensgang. And he did it with a consulting company, a Norwegian consulting company called Red Pill Linpro. It all evolved they turned it into Varnish Software, which is a commercial company offering uh, premium support and, and those sorts of things. And it's a reverse proxy only, just saying. You'll see Nginx does more than just reverse proxying. Started in 2005, and you see that it evolved, and last year they released Varnish version 4. Anyone using v4 already in this room? Are we liking this? Yes? Yeah? Okay, good. Happy to know, I like it as well. Uh, and there have been some considerable changes. I've done this talk a couple of times and this one focuses on Varnish v4. I know if you use CMSs like Magento or Drupal or WordPress, everything is still focused on v3, which is okay. This is v4 and you'll see. Nginx then again, I could have added the Russian flag. I kind of preferred, since we're dealing with stereotypes, to add the Soviet flag, and their uh, motto is get async or get sunk, which is nice. Do you see the battleship in the back? In the back? It's pretty cool. It was invented by a guy called Igor Susuev, or Sisuev. My Russian is a bit flaky, I guess. And it started in 2002, so a pretty old project. And it, I think I should update these numbers. I think it's more than 15% of the internet these days. And it was specifically built as a web server and as a proxy, reverse caching proxy, to deal with the CK10 problem. What do you do if you have 10,000 concurrent connections? How do you handle this? It's event-driven async, all the fancy buzzwords, everything on top of it. And I checked, and the most recent version is 1.7.10. Okay, let's install it. Let's install this software. Let's do this. Uh, who's here using, who's on Linux, right? Who uses Linux for their server? Okay, that's good. Anyone not using Linux? 
We're not yet using Linux. Cool. We have clients who have Windows IIS-based setups using .NET, and we've put a varnish on a small Linux box in front of it, so it's all compatible. We still speak HTTP. Who here using Linux is on Debian Ubuntu systems? Yeah. Anyone on CentOS, Red Hat? Oh. I'm more of a Debian Ubuntu kind of guy, so my examples will primarily be apt-get style installs. There's plenty of documentation online on how to do this with what you have, yum and RPM and all those sorts of things. So here we go. This is how you do it in Ubuntu. How you install Varnish, of course, mind the icons. Uh, and how you do it in Debian. I've colored or color coded two things. The distro, Wheezy is the stable version of Debian. Jesse is coming up. Apparently, Utopic is a Ubuntu one. And you can choose. You can add Varnish 3.0 or 4.0. I chose four. When installing Nginx, there's also Debian channels there, and it's also a matter of adding the right distro, the key signing, you can find the instructions here. So it's pretty easy. Register the channels, apt, get, install, varnish, or Nginx, and you're good to go. Configuring it is, requires a bit more detail. If you use Ubuntu and Debian systems, as I do, there's a file called etc, default, varnish. And this file contains all the startup options you need. Once you start Varnish, it will behave in such a way. Right here, I mentioned that I bind to all IP addresses. You see an empty, empty spot right here. And they listen on port 80, which makes sense, of course, right? That is the standard HTTP port. There is an admin interface here, an admin interface over Telnet. Yes, not SSH, Telnet, unencrypted Telnet, on port 6082. I've binded to my local host, but you can open it up as long as you firewall it in the correct way. Then there's this term called VCL, and you see the extension here. It stands for Varnish Configuration Language, and it's actually a sort of domain-specific language that you can use to uh, do caching policies. And there's a file called etc varnish default VCL, and that's where all your policies are. If you authenticate with the admin interface, there is a secret file. There's no username password authentication. It does a sort of uh, challenge where you use your, when you get a sort of challenge and you use your uh, secret key and you hash it in a specific way and you get access. And the final one here, and there's plenty more, but these are just the default ones, is which storage are we using? Malloc, of course, which means memory. We'll store it in memory. And we've assigned uh, 256 megabytes. In reality, in production servers, you might want to increase that number. When you're in the VCL file, located in that location. The minimum thing you need is just to define a backend. Where is that web server of ours located? In this case, it's on the same machine. I use the local host, so the loopback interface, on port 8080, which is somewhat dis uh, described as the alternative HTTP port. For Nginx, you see, different icon. For Nginx, it's like defining virtual hosts. Uh, who's familiar with Nginx? Who is not that familiar with Nginx? And for those, keep your hand in the air. For those who are not familiar with Nginx, are you familiar with Apache? Yes? OK. Well, you have virtual hosts in Apache as well. This is quite similar, but it has the curly braces standard. Uh, as you can see, you define a server name, a listening port. Uh, and what we do here, and this is kind of interesting, this is where we refer to our backend. We, do, we use the proxy module, which is built in, in Nginx, and we say, pass it to the local host using the HTTP protocol on port 8080. Quite the same thing. And when you do so, store it in a named zone called proxy cache. It's something that is defined elsewhere, and I'll show you. And the caching key you use is the scheme. These are all variables, that is HTTP or HTTPS, the host name, the request URI. If you cache things and you get a 200 or a 302, cache it for an hour. And that's how it works. In the main Nginx configuration file, you define that cache zone. You say, proxy cache pop, I'll be storing this on the temporary file system, which might be in RAM as well. And I'll have two levels of hashing, because it will be stored on disk, but it will be optimized using the, the operating system uh, memory. It's two levels. So you'll have a directory, a hash directory within, and then another hash directory in that. And we call it proxy cache. It's 10 megabytes big. And if data is inactive, we'll remove it from disk within five minutes. So if within five minutes we don't use this information, we remove it. And it could be a maximum size of a gigabyte. So that's how these things work. If you're using this and you're still using Apache, you need to change your Apache as well if it's hosted on the same machine, that being said. So if you're using Debian and Ubuntu style systems, go to ports.conf change the port, and if you bind your ports to your virtual host, please do those as well. 
All right, PHP, it's what we do, right? Uh, I love these elephant kind of things, but I'm, it's really hard to understand why we use an elephant. Because if you look at the traits of an elephant and PHP, are they similar? Are they? Think about it. So if we use PHP, because I'm going to give you a couple of examples on, on how to use PHP. We have uh, Apache. A lot of people still use Apache. And how do we connect PHP with Apache? <laughs> Who uses, and let's do a show of hands. Who uses mod PHP still? I sometimes use it. Mod PHP is actually embedding uh, the PHP library as an Apache module. So the PHP space is the Apache space. Who uses old school fast CGI? We still have lots of that at the office. It's not that flexible, it's not that perform. It's very flexible, I'm sorry, very flexible, but it doesn't perform that well. And if you use the latest version of Apache, the 2.4, there's a module called Mod Proxy FCGI, and that allows you to do remote fast CGI connections to, let's say, PHP FPM. Who's using PHP FPM in here? Oh, that's nice. Uh, I ask these questions every now and then, and I see that there is a, an increase in popularity regarding uh, PHP FPM. And you can store it behind either Varnish or an Nginx. If you use Nginx as the web server instead of Apache, you can do a shortcut. It does native fast CGI proxying uh, based on FPM, uh, and it is cacheable. These results are cacheable. Remember the proxy pass syntax I showed you? You can also do fast CGI caching. So that means that you have both use Nginx at the same time as a web server and as a reverse caching proxy. What does it cache? Not the HTTP traffic, because there's no HTTP traffic between the FPM node, which listens on port 9000, and the Nginx. No, it caches the fast CGI traffic, which is slightly different, but has very similar results. It saves you node, so you don't need to put varnish in front of Nginx, in front of PHP FPM. You just use Nginx PHP FPM, you define your key as we did in the previous example. We use the cache validity to define that it needs to be cached for an hour, and we use a named zone that we can define. So that's fairly interesting. And if you look at this scheme, you see that the client directly connects to Nginx, and Nginx caches results sent to PHP FPM. Varnish is working on this feature but they've been working on this feature for years. I, every year I go to this URL <laughs> and see if it's evolved. It has not evolved. And nowadays people ask the question, what about HHVM? Anyone interested in how to connect to HHVM? Yeah, yeah. Well, you install it. They have packages. You can find it on the GitHub page by, uh, I think it's github.com slash Facebook slash HHVM, if I'm not mistaken. And you can easily install it. It comes with a server configuration file, which looks like this by default. So they use port 9000 as well. And they communicate over fast CGI. What you do is you install it. You stop your PHP FPM. You start your HHVM, and you're good to go. So essentially, it's a drop-in replacement, and supposedly much faster. And the configuration file here in Nginx is exactly the same. It's a drop-in replacement. But in previous releases, so prior to version 3, they had the built-in web server using libevent, all bells and whistles. Let's try to do an example. And I read this. Uh, I just marked the stuff that's interesting in yellow. As of 3.00, we're going to ship, H we we're not going to ship the HTTP server anymore. It's unmaintained. And managing web servers is not a core competency, competency uh, of the open source group that manages it. We built fast CGI support just for this purpose. So if you're using HD, HVV, HHVM or planning to use it, use fast CGI. And then the, the next question, what about Node.js? Since we're talking about hipster technology, right? What about Node.js? How can you connect those? You can install it this way. This is how you install it. And this is our little script. What it does is you send the text and it echoes the result back. And in Nginx, we can define a sort of mapping strategy. It's just translating the variable. So based on the HTTP upgrade variable, if uh, it will give you a default value for this one being upgrades, and if there's no value, you just call it close. So what it does here is you set a specific header to upgrade the connection. And upgrading the connection allows you to do WebSockets, because that's what a lot of people still do using Node.js. So in essence, you can put Nginx in front of a large amount of, of, of instances here. It shouldn't be one instance. You can define an upstream a sort of load balancing strategy and have multiple Node.js instances. Why would that be useful? Because from what I've heard, 
it's not a rumor, it's just how I was informed. Node.js is a single threaded, and if you have a multi-core machine, you can't really use the power of the multiple cores. So what you can do is spawn per core you have an instance of Node.js and just let Nginx handle it. It won't be cached, and that's important. We're talking about reverse proxies, and caching is a part of this presentation, but this one won't cache, because we're talking about real-time traffic. That's the goal of WebSockets, having this sort of real-time uh, communication, and we're not going to cache this. Varnish can do it as well. Uh, this is VCL code, so this is like the, it has hooks where you can hook into. So VCL reg V means when we receive the request, we're going to check, and it's a little bit object oriented, in the request, in the HTTP header, is there an upgrade header? If that upgrade header tilde, which means regular expression, looks like WebSocket, then we're going to return pipe, which means we're not going to cache it, we're going to send it over directly to the web server. And when we pipe it, we upgrade the connection. So we use the HTTP syntax to upgrade this. So this is essentially the way how you can proxy WebSockets in Node.js. And there's a client in there as well, and you send tests, and it answers back. Uh, I mentioned in the very beginning of this presentation that caching is a feature, but you can do compression, you can do load balancing, you can do SSL termination. So all these features are possible, and uh, look at your own use case and see where this comes in handy. Out of the box, so now we've, we've skipped the or that we've done the intro, we've discussed quite a bit. I'm going to talk about the rules, the out of the box behavior. And let's talk about varnish first. What will varnish not cache? Post, delete, put, and methods at such. What will it? Cache in terms of methods, get and head, those it will cache. And that makes sense. If it sees cookies or authentication headers coming in from the browser, it will not cache. If it sees set cookie headers being sent from the backend, it will not cache. By default, you can override this, of course. Starting a varnish v4, if it sees the no cache, no store, or private dialect of the cache control headers, it won't cache either. Prior to that, it would just stop caching if it sees a TTL equal to zero or lower than zero, and it would ignore these kinds of terms. As of four, it no longer does, and it respects it. Nginx will not cache, post, delete, and put, and it will respect a no cache, no store private syntax. It won't cache the set cookie headers, but it will cache cookies. So if you have an incoming cookie, Nginx will cache it, so mind that. If the TTL is lower than zero or equal zero, it won't cache it either. And if there's a custom X Excel expires header set to zero, it won't cache either. And we've been talking about cookies for a while now, so let's continue that conversation. And for those who aren't aware, cookies come in two shapes and sorts. We have browser-based cookies, uh, so if you haven't been to a website, you won't have a cookie by them, and initially, when the system, the server, wants you to set a cookie, it will initiate a set cookie uh, header. Your browser will receive that cookie. It will store it in the cookie store of your browser, and for every next request, the cookie will be sent. If we want to bypass or make sure that Nginx respects this as well, so not caching the cookies, this is a trick. You set a variable, a bypass variable to zero, and if there's an HTTP cookie, so if there's an, any random cookie, set the bypass to one, and cache bypass or no cache will make sure this does not get cached. The difference between bypass is that it will not use items stored in the cache, it will go to the back end, and the results could be cached, whereas no cache instructs it not only to skip and bypass the cache, but not store the results being returned. Monitoring and logging. Let's get into that. How are we doing on time? Still good? My counter's off, so no, cue, no clue how long I'm in this. Uh, monitor and logging. Good old Nginx has what we know as an access log and an error log. Not that much tooling, pretty basic. And it has a default log format, as you can see here, remote address, remote user, yada, yada, yada. But you can extend it, and that is nice. There's a variable called upstream cache status, and you can add this to your logs, and you can check out your logs uh, too. You can also set that your logs get flushed to disk every X amount of minutes, because if you use a rather large production system and store the disk, your disk will Will disk will run out of space, and you will be spending lots of I.O. and maybe other resources on just doing the logging part besides the actual caching part. So you can say flush it to disk every five minutes and store it in gzip format, and it's possible. And this upstream cache status variable can return any of these. It's very verbose. Either it could be miss, where it means it wasn't stored in cache, or bypass, that you actually bypass the cache. 
expired is, yes, it is in cache, but it's no longer valid, it's stale. Or updating means, yes, it was stale, and I am currently connecting to the backend to fetch that data, so please wait while I'm updating. Stale, uh, if you use the use stale variable in or the configuration parameter within the config, it will return this. Revalidate it means it does a sort of if non match e tag style check. So you can see that. Or it could be a hit. So any of those. That being said, just experiment it with your, uh, yourself. Uh, you'll find these in the logs. And I'll show you a trick at the end of the presentation where you can actually have this in your response headers. So you can use a tool like Firebug or any other tool you have in your browser to see the responses. You can then validate this. Varnish has more tools. Uh, and this is the goal of this presentation, comparing the both tools and doing the pros and the cons. A definite pro of Varnish is that they have lots of tooling that will give you great insight. Let's start with Varnish stat. It is, a it is a binary. If you run it, it continuously upgrades, updates, and shows you statistics. And these are some of the statistics, uh, averages that you can see here, average of the last 10 seconds, 100 seconds, and 1,000 is uh, the amount of time it took uh, running it. And you can see that you can see the number of hits, the misses, backend connections, reusing of existing connections. There's a lot of stuff in there that you can use. Uh, number of expired objects, number of backends, number of objects in your cache. So if you care about the state of your Varnish cache, run this. There are options that you can pass to it to only see certain amounts of uh, pieces of information. There are even like vague uh, configuration parameters that are not in here because you can only fit that much on screen. And there's more in Varnish than you can fit on this. So you can fiddle with the parameters and display other settings as well. I'm particularly fond of Varnish log. I love this tool because it's an in-memory activity log. So it's not stored on disk. It just takes a snapshot of what passes through the cache. And you can look into it. And it's very, very verbose. It comes with a price, too. If you run Varnish log without any filtering parameters on a very busy production system, you won't be able to read this. It will just flow by. But it's very, very, very descriptive. As you can see, we started a request, and it comes in. And the request was from IP 10.10.10.1. This is a, var a vagrant box on which I tested this. And I do a get request on the slash, so on the home page. And the uh, host name I use, the virtual host, is varnish v4.dev. I see some user agent information. So this is just incoming headers that you can analyze. <coughs> and then all of a sudden, you see VCL call, VCL return. And this is where it gets interesting. This is where you can see what Varnish is actually doing. And this will always happen. You will receive the request. The browser will send you the request to the proxy. And then it will make decisions. And one of the decisions is, I will hash this information and look it up in the cache. That means if there's a cookie or an authorization header, it won't do that. It will just pass to the backend. But this means it is cacheable in theory, not in practice, and will continue. And we get into the hashing part, where we compose the hash, and the hash is composed of the URL, the host name, or other param parameters that you pass to it. And it actually found it in, ca in cache. It's looking it up, and it says, it's a hit. What we're serving here comes from memory, which is good. So no backend connection required. And in the end, we'll de deliver it back. So this is, I think, descriptive enough, right? And from the client part, you can send these headers. These are resp headers. These are response headers that you send back. Just a minor uh, remark on these tags. These are tags you can filter on. So rec means the request incoming. VCL is everything internal. And then you have resp is the response being sent back. If you do backend connections, you'll see backend request, backend header, and so on, and so on. As of Varnish v4, they drastically optimized this binary. It used to be quite crappy, I have to admit that. Even I, I can say this face to the camera. Dear Varnish people, I didn't like your Varnish log tool in Varnish v3. Because it didn't allow you to filter on tags, so only display certain tags, and filter on values. You could pick either, but not both, which sucks. This is, and kudos, Varnish v4 team. This is a, a very good optimization. And for that reason alone, I would advise you to upgrade. It gives, it gives you insight. They've added a small query language called the VSL language. And it says, I only want to see the, I don't want to see all the information. I only want to see the URLs of which the internal status, the VCL calls that we use is hit. So we want to see all the hits. We can do the same thing and want to see all the misses. So everything that goes to the back end. Or, 
You want to see the URLs that require the backend connection, of which the backend connection took more than two seconds, which is very useful information. Or we want to have all the URLs which have a response status within the 400 range. So something that was the client's fault, right? And that we want to have a look at. So very, and this is just an example. There's tons of possibilities here. Varnish top is another binary we use. It has similar behavior as varnish log, but it does an incremental list. It's like when you do top on Linux, it shows you incremental data. And it has uh, query expressions too. We want to see all the top URLs. So you'll see a URL, and then you see a number next to it, the amount of hits it gets, or the amount of times it occurs, the amount of hits on this URL, the amount of misses on this URL. The top response status is, what is my top response status? I really hope it's 200 that is being at the top. It's, if it's 503 or 500, you're in some kind of trouble. And so on and so on. What, what are the top user agents? I need to explain you something about the flow, because this looks somewhat nice, and we see we've talked about hits and lookups and misses and delivers. But Varnish has a clear state machine, and that will help you to understand the logic of things. When a request starts, it gets into receiving mode. And all these hooks that you'll see, that you've already seen in the VCL and that you'll continue to see throughout this presentation, use keywords that match a certain state. We start with receiving. If we receive something, we can either pipe, that means sending it off to the back end without interfering with anything of the cache. This is just a raw TCP IP connection. You send the data off, no responsibilities that follow. Yes, take a picture of that. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, the slides will be online, and I'll try to do that today or tomorrow, so you'll be able to see that. So you can either pipe it and say, I don't want anything to do with this caching thing, or we can say, we're going to pass it along uh, to the back end because we don't feel comfortable caching this. Why? It could be a cookie, could be an authorization header, could be any other reason that you program it in your VCL. But when things are looking good and are cacheable, we're going to use the hash method. So we have states, and state transitions happen through methods, through actions. One of those actions is hash. When we hash it, we're looking it up in cache. And when we look it up, it could either be a hit, a pass, like do not even look if it's a hit or a miss. We get into lookup state and say, I don't care about this, send it back to the back end. Or otherwise, it could be a hit or a miss. If it's a hit, we deliver. And this is one of the states that always occur. We always deliver, or nearly always deliver, and we receive. If it's a miss, we're going to fetch it from the back end. And we're going to store it in cache and deliver it back. So that is the flow, and I hope this makes sense to you. Yes? Yeah? You're still, still with me? Some people feel sleepy? No? OK. And that reflects in the Varnish log output. See? We receive first. We do a hashing operation. Then we reach the hashing state. When we look it up, it could be a hit, and then we deliver it. So that makes sense. And that will give you, if you use this, the, this nice little state diagram, compared with this, you will see, OK, this is what actually happened. And that's the insight you need. Let's go over caching keys, because those are important as well. This is the default caching strategy in Varnish. And that's, again, a piece of VCL. We're going into the VCL hash state. So that's actually composing the hash key that will return the object from cache. We will always use the request URL as a key, and we'll hash that in whatever mechanism it uses. And if a, there's a host, if we use virtual hosts, as we mostly do, right? We use host names and not that much IP addresses. Use the host. If we don't use it, use the IP address. And then return it and look it up in cache. In Nginx, either if you use the proxy caching part, which is proxying HTTP traffic, or if you use the fast CGI cache key, which is fast CGI caching, you can define it as such. And I've showed you in previous examples at the virtual host level that you can define these things. So this is the basic thing. But here is where it gets interesting. You can hash cookies. I always told, or I told you numerous times that Varnish does not cache cookies. But sometimes you want it to be so. Uh, websites or applications that, let's say we use countries or languages. Those are, are pretty common things. When the language or the country where you're entering is not reflected in the URL, you need another way of storing that state. And a country cookie, let's say you go to a page, you enter a splash page, you select your country or language, and it gets stored in a cookie. And sometimes you want to use that cookie to actually show different versions, different variants of a page based on the location where they're at. In Varnish, we could use such a thing. If there is a, con if there, so this is a long string with, I think it's semicolon separated. If there is a term called country within, this means we can additionally 
use that to hash. You're not seeing anything about URL or anything about uh, uh, host name in here. Why? Because we're not doing a return statement. If there's no return statement, it will execute this and go to the default one. And the default one I showed you, use the URL, use either the IP or the host name. So what we do here is we hash the data, which is a function in Varnish. We do a regular expression substitution. So we look at the cookie. We define this pattern, so anything before country, and then this is the country, and we replace it with one. So what we essentially do, if you have UK as the cookie value, it will just have the term UK or Belgium or NL or DE or FR, whatever you want to do. This is very flexible. In Nginx, it's even simpler. Uh, Varnish does not have that. Nginx does. They register variables based on the cookie names. So cookie underscore country is a variable in Nginx that you can use just to address any other cookie. And you can just define it as such. If there is no country cookie, that will be an empty string. So no harm done, right? So if you ever want to hash cookies, this is a way you can do it. I have specific varnish presentations where we go in much bigger detail. And they're online as well, so I can, uh, I can give you the links to that. And it digs deeper. This is just an overview, a general overview. It's one of those sayings, right? What are the hardest things in computer science? It was naming things, I guess. That was one of them. And cache purging is definitely one of them. And off by one errors was definitely in that list, too. So, uh, but cache purging is kind of hard, but there, there are mechanisms in both systems to do so. I have to admit, Varnish is better at this. It has a better syntax. So what you can do in the beginning is say, uh, we'll invent some method that will imply that a URL needs to be purged. When you use get, you retrieve it. When you use post, you change things. The same thing with put, delete. But we invented the word purge here. And when we see a purge coming in, that means that very URL needs to be removed from cache. And we return the purging method. So, boom, gone from the cache. And you can hook into your CMS and do a curl call to any other URL you want to get out of the cache, use the purge term. This is one of the ways of doing this. It's essential, it's really, really important that you put return here, because if you're not doing return, it will continue in the flow, and Varnish will say, this is not get or head and it will just bypass it. So returning is essential. Another thing that might be important, and I didn't mention here just for the sake of simplicity, is you might want to protect this with an ACL, because if I know there's a purge method on your website, I'm sure as hell going to use purge on every other page just to screw around. So there's ACL syntax in Varnish. But Varnish has improved this, and now has a sort of ban syntax. And the banning syntax is much more flexible. It allows you to interact with certain variables in there. So what we want here is if we use perch, we're going to make sure that everything is perch that matches the host and it matches the URL. And then you're going to return band. You're going to stop. Synth means synthetic output. That's stopping any connection, returning HTML, I guess. But there's more flexibility. If we re replace that double equal sign with a tilde, we can do sort of matches. We can say everything that starts with this URL pattern, we want gone. Everything that is below there needs to disappear as well. And you can do a lot of combinations there. So you're flexible enough not to just delete single URLs, but patterns of, uh, of data stored in your cache. How do you remove it? With curl, it's possible. You use purge or ban or any other word you're using. But there's a powerful alternative, and that's Varnish ADM. And Varnish ADM is a binary. You have when you install Varnish. When you type it, it makes that Telnet connection to the administrative interface that I told you about. It does that. You can also Telnet, remote Telnet, or locally Telnet to 6082 and do the authentication uh, thing. And then you can say ban rec URL equals slash. So let's remove it from the homepage. So you don't need to interfere with VCL. There is a connection strategy. You can connect over TCP IP and issue that ban. Nginx, on the other hand, has a different strategy. It stores things on disks. So what you do is you use grep. You look for the URL that you want in the location where you know your cache is stored and remove it. That's a way of doing it. There is a plugin, a third-party plugin by a guy who names himself Sprickle, that has a module called Nginx Cache Purge. You need to compile that into Nginx. It's not enough to just put it there. You need to compile it in. And he has a fast CGI or a proxy cache purging uh, mechanism. Uh, Nginx also has a commercial module. So nginx.org is the website, but you have nginx.com as well. And if you take the, the commercial solution, it's built in as well. 
not in the open source version. In the open source version, you need this little thing. And as you can see, either fast CGI cache purge, or if you're proxying to a actual web server rather than PHP FPM, use proxy cache purge. And then you can do this, purge the host name, your page, and it behaves in a similar way. Okay, that being said, let's go to load balancing. Everyone still with me? Everyone still somewhat awake, right? Okay, let's talk about load balancing for a minute. And let me go to this side of the room. I haven't been giving you enough attention, right? So, uh, Varnish has this concept of health checks. So you can register a probe, as you can see here, and you can uh, define your expectancies. We want to go to status.php uh, with an interval of 60 seconds. If it's not responding within 0.3 seconds, something has gone wrong, we'll have to do that eight times to consider it healthy, I guess, and a threshold of three. Initially, we tried three times, and the expected response is an HTTP 200. If that is not the case, your backend that you can see there, that is reference to this health check, will be considered unhealthy. And an unhealthy backend is a bad backend. Okay. In Nginx, you can do matches and define your expectancies here and do health check there to go through. If you have a set of instances linked, that's the way to define this backend is not healthy. Switch to the next one. And in Varnish, we can map backends. We can have a whole load of backends and put them in a, a sort of group called directors. And directors allow balancing through backends, either round robin, randomly, based on hashes, or uh, in a master-slave way. There are other ones, more difficult ones, that I'm not going to mention. This is the random backend. Uh, it's important when you do, for the, so who has experienced with Varnish version 3? When, have you done v4 already? Please, 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 pretty please mention VCL 4.0 or your script will not work. They changed the way, so in previous editions, that this was entirely different. This is the new way you do load balancing in Varnish. You reference your backends. We have, let's say, an Nginx and an Apache. We import the director's module because you need to import that these days. And you hook into the initialization script and define a director, a virtual director, that does random. Uh, random lookups. You add the Apache backend, you add the Nginx backend, and you can add weights here. So if you have a more powerful box, let's say your, your Apache is more powerful than your Nginx, you're going to give it a higher priority. And then you, instead of setting the backend, you're going to hint that the backend should be the backend of the director. And in that way, it will just do random, uh, random lookups. It will select a random backend based on the weights. We can do fallback as well. So similar deal, look, look how it changes. It doesn't change that much. You add them, and it has a fallback mechanism. So that means always use Apache first, and if Apache fails, use Nginx master-slave setup. Very similar. We can use IP hashing. So we use a hash director, and we say that our backend hint is this backend, and we use the client identity, which stores the IP address of the client as a Hash. And that way you can do sticky IP. Uh, if you don't have a session clustering mechanism in your PHP runtime, you can make sure that a user always goes to the same backend. And in that way, keep the sessions intact and make sure that if you have a shopping cart, let's say, it's still there when upon the next visit. You can do entirely different stuff here as well. Client identity, you can override that. You can distribute based on user agents. Uh, let's say Internet Explorer, let's send those to the slower backend, right? <laughs> Maybe. In, uh, in NG, like, so you, if you can do hashing based on the URL. So if you do reg.url, it will do hashing that way. And, in, uh, and that's fairly interesting, because then you can separate based on, uh, on URLs, and you can cache more. Let, let's say you put varnishes behind varnishes, and that is something that is commonly done. Let's say you have a huge amount of data, and it doesn't fit into one varnish. Let's say you have one terabyte of data that you want to cache, cache, and your varnishes have 32 gigabytes of RAM. Problem, right? So what you can do is set up a bunch of varnishes next to each other, put another varnish in front of it, and use a hash director. Or you can even put Nginx in front of varnish and let it distribute the, the request based on the URL so that URLs always go to the same machine. And then you can horizontally scale your caches, which is quite nice and quite useful. This is how you do it in Nginx. You define an upstream. As you can see here, you mention all the backends. You can add weights if you want to. You can connect over Unix sockets, TCP IP. 
and you just reference the backend. We call it backend, reference it here, you're good to go. Same deal applies to, uh, to PHP FPM. If you have multiple PHP FPM instances, you can do it in such a way. You can do fallback as well. Define it in a similar way, but add backup to your slave machines. Problem solved. You can do IP hashing too. Just mention IP hash here, and it will just send it based on the IP. Very useful. OK, we're still on board. Load balancing clear. Uh, there are better load balancing solutions than Nginx or Varnish. Uh, you, like HA proxy is a very good one. You have, if you have really expensive network equipment, you can do your load balancing there. Another thing I particularly like are hit and miss markers. Let's say you're working on your project, and you want to know, is this piece of information coming from my cache? Or is it coming from the back end? How do you know? You can do Varnish log, but maybe it's not that useful. Or maybe you have so much traffic that you don't want to bother with Varnish log, and you just want to see it in a response header. You can do that with a hit missed marker. So when you hook into the delivering part, and the delivering part, if you paid close attention, is the bottom part of the state diagram. It's what always happens. It's the last piece of the puzzle before the response is returned. So if your object that you're returning has more than zero hits, it's a hit. And then you say the response, so what you're sending back to the user, do an X cache header, hit. In any other circumstance, do a miss. And that way you can use Firebug or any other tool to see if it was a hit or a miss. Remember that upstream cache status variable that we logged to the logs, you can just add a header that way within any tag, a location block in Nginx, and it will be very verbose. This is just hit or miss. Remember that it was hit, miss, stale, revalidating, updating, and so on and so on. How long do we want stuff to be cached is a very important question. And there were a lot of disciplined developers here, right? Who uses cache control within the application? Very disciplined people. For those people who aren't that disciplined or work with legacy stuff that they don't want to refactor, you can override the time to live if you want to. So this is the standard way of doing things. So five seconds, because it's as max age, right? Anyone pr familiar with, these, with the difference between max age and as max age? For those who are not, max age is defined for browsers. How long should your browser cache it? Shared max age is for proxies. So Varnish will respect that one. If that one is not there, it will go to max age. If max age is not there, it will take expires. Nginx doesn't, weird enough. They'll take the max age. But you can override it yourself. And this is, so Varnish v3 people, this is a change. This used to be called VCL fetch. It's no longer called VCL fetch. It's called VCL backend response. And when your response comes back and your URL, your, your, whoa, that's weird, your URL starts with blah, you'll override it and say the backend response, the TTL wasn't the original cache control based value, will override at to 10 seconds. And then in, in any other case, it'll be cached for an hour. This has priority over any other header you send. So if you do it that way, forget about your cache control headers. If you don't have cache control headers and you want more control, this might be a way. In Nginx, you can define it here, proxy cache valid. And your other URL could be here. This is the exact replica from Varnish to Nginx. See, URLs that start with blah, those are the ones. We've reached the final, so how much time do I still have? 10 minutes, brilliant. This is the last chapter of this presentation. I'll think we'll be bang on time. Edge side includes. Who has used edge side includes before? Who is currently using edge side includes in production? Nice. Who has never heard of edge side includes? This will blow your mind, <laughs> right? Like people who use edge side include, will it blow their minds? Please nod yes or no. Yes, this, this is magic. And I've chose, so I have an iStock photo account paid by the company. I, now and then I add a picture. And this is exactly, the, this def precisely defines what edge side includes is about. It's about chopping up your page into different puzzle pieces and having more control about puzzle pieces. I'm going to do something really bad now. I'm going to do something very PHP 3 and PHP 4 style. Have a file per, per feature, right? We have a header.php and a footer.php, and we have a menu. Maybe you can even have frames, old school frames, right? <laughs> but when we render this, it's one big page. It's one big chunk of HTML, and you can only add a single cache control header. 
If you want it to be there for an hour, it's there for an hour. But let's say you want this to be cached for 10 seconds, this for two, your header, which has welcome person X in it, you don't want it to be cached because it has cookies, and the footer, well, five seconds is good enough. How do you do that? And the answer is quite clear, right? Edge site includes. This is bad, right? <laughs> but it, it makes sense. It's, it's for the sake of this example, I will not write this kind of code. You will not write, probably, right? Are you? No, one, no one is going to write this kind of code. But it shows you how it works. You have this block that you're going to include, and this block, and this block, and this block. But what if, see the difference? What if we use tags that Varnish understands? Varnish understands these tags. These, this is an actual standard in W3C, which was, if I'm not mistaken, invented by the dear people at Akamai. Akamai being one of the uh, bigger CDNs in this world. And they defined a standard, kind of like SSI. Who remembers SSI from back in the day? Old school people, right? It's similar. You register these tags, you mention a source, and if you send this to a browser, a browser will not understand this. Not by a, not by a long, not by a mile even. But Varnish does, and when it sees it, it will fetch these blocks and cache them separately in separate locations, on the, in either on the file system or in memory. And it will respect the cache control header. So if in this footer.php you say five seconds, it will respect that. If it's two seconds, it will respect that. If the header is not cacheable, it will respect that. So that is very cool, and that gives you fine control over all the little bits and pieces and content blocks. This is a way of setting it up. This is a way. So when you receive a request, we'll send a, and this is, a, this is the symphony way of doing this. I learned this from Fabien, watching Fabien Potencier talk about caching. He said, there's a surrogate capability header, which is an, an official header, and it says that it can handle ESI. So you send a header to your backend saying, look, I am Varnish, I understand ESI. If you send me ESI, I will understand. And then in your code, you will look for that header, and when, you look for, when you've looked for it, you'll send ESI back, but you'll add a response. And you'll say, OK, you have surrogate capabilities. Well, hell, I have surrogate control, and I'm going to send you a piece of ESI. So that way, that two-way communication allows you to do ESI rendering. You don't want these on all your pages. right? The, the pages that don't have ESI tags, you don't want to spend CPU cycles and memory on that. So only when there's communication in both ways. And there is a way of doing this in Engine X. I haven't tried it, but there's a trick. Don't write it down just yet. Wait, wait, wait. There's, there's a better trick. Instead of using edge side include, you can use old school server side includes in Nginx and use include virtual like back in the day. And Nginx will deal with this. And Nginx will look at the cache control headers and it will store it. And it works. It's a hack, I admit, but it works. And the only thing you need to do is set SSI on, and you're good to go. And you can put if blocks in there with URL matches or other matches, and it will just work. It's not exactly a drop-in replacement, but as developers, we can make this sort of switch where we check, is it a Varnish or an Nginx, and either render SSI or ESI, no matter what. It's finalized with SSL, SSL support. Varnish does not support SSL. It's a political decision. They can if they want to but they don't want to. So pool heading comp is strongly against uh, adding SSL support to Varnish. Nginx does support it, and it has SPDY support as well. So eventually, let's say you have an e-commerce store, right? E-commerce, and we want Varnish in front of it, but no one is ever going to buy something unless we offer SSL, because we care about our privacy. So in the end, there are situations, and we've had those, where you put an Nginx, that does the SSL termination, maybe a bit of SPDY, sends a request to Varnish. Varnish sends it to Nginx back, to another Nginx, because that's the web server, which sends it to PHP FPM, and all the way back. We have five more minutes. Nice. So this is how you could do it. It's a way, define your certificates, and do the rest of the business there. Listen on 443, good to go. You can register port 80 as well, and then do a, an automatic forward to 443 if you want to enforce SSL. This is the very end of this talk. And now I'm going to stand in the middle of the room and ask you, 
If you think that Varnish won the battle, raise your hand. If you feel that Nginx has won the battle, raise your hand. See, I have that every time. Everyone thinks Nginx is more powerful than Varnish. But in the end, it's a matter of using the right tool for the job. And if Nginx floats your boat, well, then go for Nginx. But in a lot of cases, we combine things. Like Nginx is also excellent for dealing with static files. We use Nginx for that. Or we have a project where we don't need that much control over the, the flow, because Nginx doesn't really have that much of syntax to deal with the caching, whereas Varnish has an entire uh, third-party language to, to deal with this. So if you need more control, go for Varnish. If you want it plain and simple and powerful, go for Nginx. And in the end, use the right tool for the job. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you the cliche question. Any questions? There's a mic. There's a mic. Because we're recording this. Uh, and I really hate Q&A, but you can also approach me at the bar or anywhere else. But if you Hi. have some formal questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi there. Um, Hi. Can you extend your, your cookie examples to add headers into the cache keys? You can, uh, but they have to be request headers. Sure. So you can do it. So you can do a, and Varnish also supports, I didn't explain that because it went a bit further than, than normal, but there's this HTTP header called Vary, and it respects Vary headers. But you have to be careful with Vary headers, because if you say Vary cookie, it'll go nuts because it will use your Google Analytics style cookies as well, things will go nuts. But if you want to hash based on, let's say people use the accept language, you, you detect the browser language, you can do hash data and then the browser language, uh, which is a rec.htp.accept dash language, I guess, not sure. You can definitely do that. This was just an example with cookies, but if you use other mechanisms to define state based on language location, you can do all these sorts of things. So yes, the answer is yes. You can hook into pretty much any of the response to build a custom cache key in both uh, engine. Request, and not response. Sorry, request. Yeah, that's important because I figured, yeah, we can use response headers too, but it works based on re request headers because it doesn't matter if you send a re uh, or issue has hash based on re responses, it doesn't work. It needs to make sure that every request that comes in and if you have a header there, you can use it. You can also cache, let's say you use accept headers to re return JSON instead of HTML. If you don't vary on these headers, the first one is going to get it, and you're going to request something written in JSON, uh, and you expect HTML. So yes, you can use any other request header to vary on. Thank you. Hi. Um, you didn't mention performance at all, so you didn't make any Comparisons. Is that I did not make any comparisons because I will, I will be perfectly honest with you. We don't have that much traffic that we can actually see the difference. They're both so powerful that we haven't reached the limits of it. So in terms of performance, everyone says they're on par. And some people say, well, Nginx is faster for static data, but then Varnish is faster for page cache. So I can't give you those numbers because I don't have them. And I don't want to blindly steal performance reports or benchmarks from other people without actually having tried them. So we don't have that amount of traffic to, to see the difference. But I can tell you that we've successfully uh, removed a CDN for a, one of our bigger clients that does 100,000 euros an hour on sales, remove Akamai and put... Not that we have anything against Akamai, this is recorded, right? But they only sold products in Belgium, so they don't need this, the distributed geo feature. So we replaced it with Varnish, and two Varnish servers was enough to do it. And I've heard stories uh, about uh, one of the biggest news websites in the Netherlands that had 19 million unique visitors a day, and they did it with two Varnishes. So we haven't yet reached the point where we've experienced the limitations of Varnish, as long as you give it enough memory and tune your, yeah, your kernel and tune the, the, the treading settings enough so that you 